Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dmitry Baikov, and I want to welcome you on this exciting webinar, Art of Generative AI, Transforming Retail and CPG. In this session, we have a privilege of hearing the insights from Denis Baranov, our VP of Retail here in DataArt, who will address all the business challenges and potential of generative AI in retail. Hi, Denis. Hello, everyone. And myself, Technical Director of AML in DataArt, who will focus on technology side of the discussion. During today's meeting, we'll explore the history and vision of generative AI in retail, explore a couple of use cases, dive into real-world demos, and of course, discuss how to build generative AI applications. I think uh, everyone already heard about generative AI and how it transformed their productivity, and everyone noticed this boost on different levels. Writing texts, extracting fields, and getting fast access to the data was never easier than today. Human AI collaboration is getting us closer to the next productivity frontier. And actually, many businesses, from small startups to large enterprises, already started the adoption of technology. Dennis, what do you see is happening right now? How this shift is happening? Can you tell more about the situation with generative AI in retail sector today? Yeah, of course. And probably I wouldn't be the only one who talking about that topic these days. If you probably open any news as usual with a new technology or with new hype cycle, you could find quite a lot of articles about that. And this is because everyone's shocked. Yeah, So no one could imagine just two or three years ago, we will have something like that. And I remember the first days when all that city legend started, like it's not a generative AI, it's not the AI itself, it's like a million people sitting somewhere to answering to your questions. Again, it's because the people was not ready what happens immediately. And right now we are starting adoption circle and we know about that from other technologies like a blockchain many years ago or something like that. Then we start to adopt new technology. It's quite a lot of doubts around that. It's quite a lot of rumors and other stuff. That's why I find out such session really useful for us and our clients, hopefully, to talk about that topic in depth. And again, you would not be surprised right now, enterprises start to look into that technology and start to use it. And you could find many, many articles from different companies starting from Nike and end up with any other big names who talking about how to use it. Uh, still, it's not so many real cases. We will talk about a couple of them, which we done for the clients later on. But before go deeply into that, we, we probably should talk about generative AI and AI itself. Yeah, what is it as a technology? What does it mean for the world? Yeah, exactly. And this is AI is not new, right? It, it's been here for years. So, Dennis, maybe you can retrospect a bit and go back 10, 20 years ago and think what was AI for retail for that time? Yeah, of course. Unfortunately, I could not talk about 1956. Yeah, so that time was a little bit out of my league, but I, I worked with machine learning for quite a while. I done PhD on that space, and I still remember then it was not just machine, but people involvement. And again, probably when we started to talk about the technology, to train new model, uh, getting it ready, it could took for your ages. Yeah, so I still remember the times then to get some new additional information, you have to spend a couple of weeks to train your model, and you will have like a different results onto that. And that's why it started with less skepticism or with right skepticism, let's name it like that, then we are talking about that ages. But retailers use that technologies for quite a while. And again, if you say about 21st century, it's probably then they start to get more and more data because all of that based on the data. You could not train your model without data. You could not get results without data. And uh, then we start to collect more data from the people, from networks, from other stuff. We, we could train that model and predict different results. For example, retailers use it for sales predictions or for different our kinds of demand prediction. And in that, it starts to be practical. And I remember cases like, again, 10 or 15 years ago, then our clients start to use it for such things and get really good results. And of course, it's progressed. It's progressed together with the clouds. It's progressed together with our understanding how to do 
uh, manage like a large amount. We get in terms like a big data, data governments, cloud storages, etc. And it helps us to work with like a deep learning, also this large modeling. And we are continuous here to grow in generative AI, what we have right now, because it's again, as I say it earlier, it's completely game changer. It's like, uh, I don't know, something which we could not predict, but which we really like to use in many, many other cases. But again, I know it's quite a lot of confusion around what is generative AI, why it's named generative. Yeah, so Dmitry, probably based on your experience, you could put some light on that. Yeah, exactly. I think it's very important to know what is this difference and what is the shift from traditional AI, as we call it, to generative AI. And everything what you told is, is really correct. So analyzing of the data, some rule-based systems, recommendations, predictions, so super, supervised approach for, to AI, to what people already did, and we can train the system on that. This is what we call traditional AI. And generative AI, it's totally different thing. It, it can be creative, it can generate, it can be trained on your data, but out of this data, it can create the new one. It relates to text, to audio, to uh, images as, as well. And uh, this is what we see right now. So it's like self-supervised, semi-automated way to generate the new content. We have a bunch of use cases which are different from traditional AI, and this gives us much faster way for exploring the AI capabilities right now. So text classification, personalization, content creation is really complex tasks which we could not do or it were really hard to, hard to do with traditional AI. Of course, there are different issues which we face right now with some biases and harmful, harmful content. But still, it's emerging technology, and I think it's very important to understand how to adopt that and what are the use cases we can use for that. So, Dennis, maybe you can help us with the use cases for retail then. Yeah, of course. And again, I think you're absolutely right, because when we start using new technology, we try to put it everywhere. And sometimes it's harm technology itself as well, because as soon as you use it not right, you start thinking, oh, it's probably not right thing. It's never have to be used. Especially then we are talking about like a retailers where we really cautious about how we spend money and uh, in which kind we spend it. Yeah, And again, it, it would not be surprised. Yeah, so many of retail cases connected with optimizations. Again, right now, generative AI could create for your content management and other things quite a lot of, uh, I don't know, pictures, text, descriptions adopted for different styles. And previously you have to use, I don't know, 10, 20 people to create that. Right now, from the machine perspective, you could do it faster. It doesn't mean you still don't need people at all. Yeah, but you probably could reduce automatical or things which they do. And again, it's add some value. At the same time, the second thing, because we are talking about like AI, uh, create, let's say, models which will create virtual assistant, which put some chatbots for the new level, not just like a, pre-train if then model, but we could be a little bit more creative, help you with search, create different personalization. It's exactly the cases which generative AI could put to the next level. And again, it's nothing new. We, we had that previously, but again, the number of efforts which we put here, it's reduced dramatically. And somewhere, you know, it was just, uh, it's probably a little bit early for them still. Uh, but uh, last thing which I want to say, yeah, we, we probably will have quite a lot of pre-trained models or something that in future. And we could actually use that to reduce our efforts more and more. But yeah, because we probably all desperate go to the demos and we already had that slide in the, uh, our page. So let's go into that and see what we could do in reality and probably discuss that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I just want to give a couple of examples what what we did uh, on our side and uh, would be happy to share uh, three demos which we have for today. And uh, let me share the screen. And this would be the first one. So this is the, the demo we built for retail. It's uh, for 
grocery business, for e-commerce. Uh, and this is very simple uh, recipe generation. So uh, the main idea of this bot is to give you the recipe, which is in our database. So it's not generated right away. But here, generative AI is like an engine which can address and understand what are the, uh, what are the recipe, what are the ingredients, what are the uh, important parts about the ingredients. So let's see uh, the demo in action. It's, it's very simple UI, input, output, and I will just input, I want to cook lasagna. And probably we may have a different lasagna recipes and you have a big cookbook. So it will show you a couple of examples in, in the simple way. So we have vegetarian lasagna and lasagna bolognese. So, okay, let's go with uh, lasagna bolognese at this time and uh, give it a way to find what is there for lasagna. So it has the exact things what you need to buy. And uh, we continue the conversation. So uh, we have a different ways of how to uh, cook this dish, right? And these are very important ingredients and uh, how to cook eventually. So it also generates the recipe of how to cook, how to cook. And of course, it can be generated out of the knowledge of the model. Sometimes it may be not correct. But in this example, we use the model as an orchestrator between our data, our data sources. And it can be adaptable to other data sets. And uh, I totally see the benefits of uh, complex uh, tasks solving based on your data and then it's do you see more advantages of using this type of bots in domain? Yeah, of course. First of all, sometimes when I cook myself, I also have years. So I'm not worried about years in the model yet because it's like uh, close to our reality anyway. But you're right. The main thing which I see here is flexibility. Yeah, Because previously then if it worked with recipe books or something like that, we have to predict the questions which person will ask them right now we could be fully flexible and it's beauty of that because no one know which interest would be in my mind when i cook it yeah probably i want to check after that what how i could create it or how i get it is ready or not and many other things and again here I have flexibility and things which we could not predict it's good quite a lot of value in such things yeah yeah i agree so Let's put that dive to the second demo and say thank you to our bot. And uh, hopefully we'll come back to it soon. So the next demo is uh, something which is possible for e-commerce business as well. And this is about generation of product descriptions. So this is the UI which was and the model actually uh, which uh, was built in open source. And what I'm going to do here, I'm going to Amazon and I'll grab some table and save this image. And uh, this is some specific size of table. I will upload this to the model and will ask write the description for uh, this table in an Amazon style. So it will generate in real time something closer to the Amazon description. And it can be your description on your website. But what I would do next, I would select some, some different table with a totally different style and description. And as you see uh, here is it's 31.5 inch so it's different size and uh, i will took this description and uh, make it more generic uh, make it less generic and make it more precise to this description so i will write please write description in this style in the different table style i will copy paste that and i will write integrating these data these parameters and i will copy paste the parameters from the first table so what we will see eventually that it adopts the style of the second table description, but integrating the uh, parameters from the first one, which means that we can transform the descriptions. And as you see, the, the sizes are different here and it gives the correct size. And we can transform different descriptions on the website and automate this process or semi-automate this process right away. So, Dennis, have you seen something, some requests like that in the real world? Is it something worth exploring? Yeah, I think it's actually a great example how technology growing from year to year. Yeah, because I know about that problem and we worked with different marketplaces where it's getting description in 20 different languages. I do not talk about like a couple of different styles 
it's it's pretty challengeable. Yeah, so we are getting photos from suppliers, and we have to put description, and we are trying to solve that problem five or seven years ago, probably with uh, pure machine learning. And it was really hard to do, to be honest, yeah? And I could not say we get like a perfect results with, yes, yeah? so we just put that POC into the shell and say, yes, yeah, so probably we still have to work with different agencies to make that happen, et cetera, et cetera. Right now I could see a cow is completely different from that historical case, how I could get that. And again, description in different styles, it's amazing, yeah, because for example, we could put some old description if we want to, I don't know, target younger audience, or we want to target different type of audience, yeah, with different backgrounds, etc., and see how it will adopt, yeah. For person, it's not easy to adopt because we all of us have our historical background, our educational background, other stuff, so we could pretend. But the model, actually, if it be trained on special text, it could completely mimic that. And I think it's really, really powerful for retailers. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So it's a great example. Uh, let's move to the next one. So we, uh, the, the last example I want to show was developed with our partners, Morenas, uh, and this is uh, called BuyMeBot. So BuyMeBot can decompose your queries into the list of products, list of steps, and connect to real world use cases. It can address different DIY products or your queries by home by different complex tasks. So what I will do here, I will put, I want to plant roses, right? And this is just some example of a request where it returns us the list, what we need to do for that. So probably we need rose seeds, we need the gloves and probably something you may have. And uh, there are some optional things like shovels, etc. So it returns everything. It returns the instructions how to do that, and it returns the integrated eBay links to real-world uh, data, to real-world glows or real-world uh, shovels. So basically, you can integrate it into any e-commerce website uh, which sells the roses and sells the garden uh, stuff, and then you will have this uh, upsell tool for your clients. And actually, you can download the results and tune it, but Let's try something more complex. So I want to build a home security and heating system uh, using Google devices. So this is a bit more challenging. So it needs to understand what does it mean overall. And as we see, it gives us some bunch of different uh, tools, uh, different uh, devices, and give us the instructions, what is first, what is second, and of course, correct links to eBay. And again, any API may be integrated. It may be Amazon, it may be your store API. It is split by high pricing, medium pricing, and small pricing. So of course we can go and uh, select some uh, smoke carbon alarm, which is a bit more expensive here. And the last thing which it can do, of course, uh, is the Christmas is coming and we want to know how to decorate the house for Christmas. So this is the game uh, which it still understands what to do. And it says, of course, you need a Christmas tree, you need uh, different garlands, etc., etc. And of course, you can buy this Christmas tree. And actually, I will add it to the cart just to show that it's real eBay store under my account. And then I will go to something more expensive and add this garland. So basically, what you can see, it's totally added and you can go to check out login and just buy these things. So I think it's pretty good accelerator. And then it's do you think it's it would be important and interesting for maybe other projects, other companies, except e-commerce stores? Yeah, of course. That's actually one of the reasons why I work in retail quite a lot. I use some products which we are building for our clients to myself. And that bot exactly which I use sometimes when I try to compile something which I have no idea how to create. It. Yeah, and it helped me a lot to find the right things. But if you are talking about more practical way, you could see which disruption could go here. And it's large one. You actually have your own aggregator or your own marketplace. You could not limit it just by one. Yeah, so And it's the same functionality, which again, previously could took to build like ages. Yeah, So you spend quite a lot of time to connect with all that APIs, etc. Right now, then you build it once, you could add more and more APIs from different marketplaces, do cross search, do cross references and other things. So 
ability just unlimited yeah and again for me it put more pressure actually on some marketplaces and retailers to be more advanced not just provide like aggregation of information it, at the same time as like a different uh, since another industry put pressure on the banks yeah then challenging banks coming so I, I i so excited about such things as well yeah yeah i agree so this is really good example okay why don't we speak how to build these actually solutions so i want to dive a bit deeper how we usually build the generative ai solution so we have four phases they are very simple we prototype and what you see on these demos it's a measure of prototype so it's six to eight weeks with defined use cases we search for the data and its quality testing on various approaches and the models, evaluation of results, and building the clickable prototype. As soon as we build that, we go to MVP stage, where we integrate, find the most appropriate data, we deploy to production, and depending on your load and depending on the use case, it may take from one to three months, it may be even faster, depending on the size. And, and after we go live, we deploy, we need to collect the feedback, of course, we need to optimize this approach as soon as we got the feedback. And hence, this approach test by A-B tests, maybe, and of course, have some monitoring. And support and go live phases are depending on your need. It can be like when you deploy to go live, you can select some other use case for prototyping, you can prototype in parallel. And actually, what's, what we uh, are uh, usually doing, we are building uh, things what's called AI platform and AI factory. So this is the next levels for uh, moving AI solution, a uh, small piece of functionality, small use case, and this is just used for testing the ideas. But when you have 10 of ideas, thousand ideas, how to incorporate all of these AI use cases. So we build a platform for that. So each other use case may be faster to implement. And the next level after the platform, the thing called AI factory, where we have some pre-built use cases, pre-built templates, pre-built bots, which can be used to the different departments and can be easily adaptable and tunable across your company. So it accelerates the new solution implementations. Uh, and this is evolving process. You can start from solution, you can go with the AI platform. If you have a lot of examples, you usually will go through the flow, which we mentioned, but this is uh, what we usually do or recommend doing. And Dennis, what do you think about this approach overall? Do you see any adoption of these things in the client space? Uh, again, I, I think it's, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So then we uh, start to adopt new technology. We have to have start from the basic because we want to see is it actually could be used for our um, organization or our problematic or something like that. So we want to have a low hanging fruits and start to get in some solution faster. Yes. Yeah? So and we experiment with POC, we worked with innovation, etc. But if you want to put it in real scale, yeah, we have to think about how to uh, let's say make it more efficient. Yeah. So if I want to have just not one POC but 10 POCs, if I want to have not just one project but 10 projects, yeah, we start talking about platform, we start talking about factories, yeah. So how to build that and in this case new technology would not be new for you anymore yeah so you know how to adopt it you all that uh, things which on the critical path and it help you to make it easier for the business to adopt that and use it and have it so uh, i completely agree and i really like that approach to be honest yeah yeah that's great and what about the organizational standpoint do you have some advices uh, how to adopt ai from strategic perspective maybe you can talk about that more uh it's again uh, it's it's different way how you adopt new technology but it's usually starting first of all from understanding where are you now yeah and we mentioned that a couple of times ai is just a part of equation yeah so you also have to have some organizational mind inside how you worked with domain or technology expertise what technology skills you have in your organization because if you do not have specialists of course we could help yeah but again your let's say age of organization from the technology perspective it's important as well and also you you should think about not just by about ai or machine learning but what is your data policies how you govern your data 
do you have like a data platform in place and many other things. But as soon as you get on that, it's probably easy to start with help again, because someone already done it one, twice, triple times, and you probably could get that information for free or again, with less point in that uh, space. And that's why we are helping our clients to build their capabilities. Again, we believe capabilities have to be inside of organization. Yeah, We could bring that externally, but you also have to start build your internal culture around like innovation and around machine learning and AI programs and we have here. And as soon as that here, it's again, it's the same. I really like that principles because I run quite a lot, but before run, you have to start working. Uh, because if you could not work for 10K, you probably could not run for 10K as well. And as soon as you have that base, as soon as you put, let's say, on board your business needs, as soon as you put on board your technical needs, you could do it easily and faster. And again, it's really important, and I will emphasize it one more time, to plan what you want to achieve. Because without that, you could achieve something, but not what will give you advantages. Yeah. And that's really, really important. I, yeah. I think that's actually probably it about. I, I agree. And the, the slide which you can see right now, this is the AI Ready program, which was developed in DataArt, and it shows the number of uh, potential things you may want to do inside your organization, how to move from crawl to run, what Dennis mentioned, how can you transform different departments, how to how can you upskill the team, and all the way through crawl, walk, and run, you go through the same uh, issues and the same ideas where you go from AI solution, AI platform, and AI factory, but from organizational level. So how to start? What is the first place to start? Are we ready to start? Do we have enough data? These are the projects and the questions you may do before you go to full-scale AI platform, but usually this is a good place to start. Just for the reference, we are doing it ourselves, and uh, this is our vision and our recommendation of what can be done. Uh, with that in mind, we are happy to move to Q&A. Probably in case you have some questions, we'll be happy to answer about this. Uh, I think it was a great insightful discussion and we already have a couple of questions. So uh, let me take this one. How long may it take to adapt your bot to a particular need? How GenAI will act if the data is bad and GenAI is not ethical? It can just remember biases information and then use only that. So let's start from the end. Dennis, can you share more ideas about ethical AI and how to act with the data? When yeah, I it? think it's actually pretty large and to, to be honest, uh, still not good enough discovery topic because that problem here for ages. Yeah, so all of us know we have a policies in place like a GDPR and others which prevent retailers to use our data without our consent. Yeah, no one want to, I don't know, all my data from LinkedIn or Facebook or any other personal profile used for that. And that's one part of the problem, yeah? So because uh, if we will use the data to train models, yeah? So do we have possibility to actually extract the data from the model or is it important to have that? And that's why many, many companies who work on the data and governments right now start committees to try to understand and adopt that and still probably rule policy not good enough to cover all that. The second thing, it's also how our model will react to that. Because models get an information from the internet and models get an information from society. And you know, society spent like a 22 centuries to adopt and be so mindful right now. Yeah. And we could not spend like a 22 centuries to adopt our models. And in the internet, it could be completely bad things. It could be completely inappropriate things. So then we put that materials. We have to be really carefully to learn or actually adopt it to make the results. But at the same time, I don't really, let's say, worried about that because, you know, right now, we are still training models. And if we get some results which are not good enough for us, it's not because model 
provide like a bad answer, so they treat it as inadequately or something like that. It's because it's like a local maximum or minimum in our knowledge, and we could retrain it, etc. But again, I still see it's quite a lot of challenges, and I don't think we could answer to that question immediately. Good answer, it's everyone thinking about that, and hopefully we will have some good or bad answers soon. Yeah, and, and I agree. And actually what Sam Altman saying, uh, CEO of OpenAI, that he had struggled with understanding the safety measures before they release even ChatGPT. So now they know much more about how to uh, tackle that and they have much more ideas when it comes public and the improvement will be iterational. So we will not get, like, get AGI, which will uh, rule the world, probably will get step by step. And about the POCs, actually we see that our POCs and the demos you saw accelerate up to two, three times of the time for making the same one for yourself. So it's quite a good acceleration uh, to what you may need and may want. And uh, I think let's go to the next question. And uh, Dennis, this is a question for you. What are your predictions for 2024? I think it's for retail and Gen AI as well. It's very hard I to think... predict something, right? Yeah, it's again, we probably should ask ChatGPT. That's in better in prediction than me right now. But again, it wouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, everyone will continue to talk about that. And hopefully we will see more and more adoptions. For me, the faster we get some real adoptions and the faster we get some real results, we will delete one that back thought which have everyone is it still a good technology to me to use yeah and many other things it's not easy to predict but again such things as a generative ai change landscape quite a lot in supply chain in how we worked with bots and other things so hopefully we will have more interesting and more bright ideas yeah sorry to be so broad but then we're talking about prediction it's that's probably the thing which not easy cover precisely yeah and i think from technology side we are way ahead and due to latest releases of different companies in this space we are very very far away and uh, for some people it's really hard to comprehend what would happen like a year ago and they are still getting there and we have much more releases getting done this fall and probably the next year would be quite transformational in terms of different modalities how we work with text and image and uh, sound together so this is my prediction that we'll get better models with the different modalities working in the different domains. And while we are waiting for more questions, uh, we have this put plus in the comments option for anyone who wants to book a workshop session for Gen AI or AI or any other topic uh, not related to this webinar, but we are happy to support and uh, jump on the call and speak about your needs and about your ideas for your company. So I'm leaving this option to the audience. Uh, anyone can can do that, I think. So, Dennis, do you have some maybe final notes on or just notes before we are waiting for more questions here? Yeah, it's again, it's probably pretty simple thing. But what I see or what I enjoy, yeah. So we had a many conversation with the clients, friends, partners about generative AI, and that's exactly the topic which we all like to talk but again so if you have some topics which probably interesting to you not just as a question feel free to put it in comments or something like that we will return to you and try to find some answers it's not just about like we will try and go to solve it but then we are talking about technology it's make a little bit clear to everyone because when we are talking about things it's interesting from different perspective yeah i agree uh, so we have a comment, Python learning methods are quite interesting. So I would agree. I, I think it's not a question for sure. Um, so yeah, great observation. Uh, so yeah, Dennis, thank you very much uh, for your time. I think it's it's a good option for everyone uh, to uh, think about data art, think about AI, think about Gen AI. Uh, feel free to connect with us on any platform and LinkedIn. We are very open to chat with you about your use case, about your data, and always find the best solution. So thank you, everyone, for taking this time with us. I hope it was useful and you found some interesting notes. And uh, see you on the later stages of AI adoption.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dmitry, for hosting that session, and thank you, everyone, for listening to us. Thank you. See you.